Please don't skip ahead yet. Hi, this is your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian, Josh LaRue. Just need a moment of your time. A lot of people don't know, but we're not able to monetize the channel here on YouTube due to the fact that the copyright holders of the books I narrate, the movies we rip, they get the ad revenue, and also being a partner on YouTube involves a lot of rules and censorship, and to do so would make it where a lot of the content, the audiobooks, the riffs, would have to be heavily censored or deleted completely. So we depend on amazing slashaholics like you to help fund the channel and keep it going and growing for years to come. And there's several fun ways to do that. You could join our Patreon right up there. And as a patron, you can join for as low as like $2, $5, $10 a month, on up as high as you want, and enjoy a lot of cool gifts like free ebooks, early access, exclusive content, even voicing characters and audiobooks here on the channel. You could also go to our PayPal and use the QR code right there. And uh, you can donate directly to the channel. We see all donations and we appreciate all of them. If you don't want to use the QR code or don't know how, you can use our PayPal email address, which will be in the description below and the pinned comment, as well as our Cash App uh, donation username. And a fun way to help the channel is through our Cameo right down there. Uh, on Cameo, you can ask for a birthday video, anniversary video. You can ask us to sing a song or something or ask us questions. And you can get a video from me, Alex, Sean, Master Evil, Mother Evil, the Rodeo Clown, any character from any show on the channel, or any character that I've voiced in the audiobooks. It's a fun way to help the channel. It's only $10 a video, and we'll have a lot of fun doing that. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoy tonight's content. Be excellent to each other. Please consider helping the channel. And always remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. Thank you. Hi, this is Jeffrey Reddick, creator of Final Destination, and you are listening to the 80 Slasher Librarian. But remember, the risk of cheating the plan, of disrespecting the design, could incite a fury that could terrorize even the grandmother. And you don't even want to fuck with that, Mac Daddy. <laughs> Final Destination, Destination Zero, an original novel by David McKenty. Chapter 3, Part 1. It is an explosion's nature to burst outwards, expanding outwards in a sphere from the source of the detonation. In a confined space, the expansion is curtailed and reflected back inwards. The pressure and blast wave can be doubled or even multiplied many times over. PETN is a commercial and military explosive that burns at 27,500 feet per second. A dozen pounds of it in the third carriage of the metro train leaving South Hill Street Station vaporized into plasma in a fraction of a second, burning through steel, aluminum, plastic, and flesh like a blowtorch turned on styrofoam. The pressure wave of heated and displaced air smashed along the aisle at supersonic speed ripping seats and people from their places. The blast burst through the carriage windows and walls and jackknifed the carriage. The carriage in front was blown off its rear wheels, forcing into the front carriage and derailing both. Hot gases and debris bloomed from the third carriage and hit the interior of the tunnel. 
The heat, flame, and shredded metal reflected back, ricocheting back into the train. Screaming, burning bodies thrashed as they were shaken around the carriages like dice in a tin cup. It was as if the passengers were the wadding in a cannon's barrel. Simultaneously, scorched by fire and pummeled by the sheer force of the blast. Less than a second later, their burnt and aching bodies were smashed and pierced by steel and glass shrapnel from the ruptured carriages. Jim Castle smiled at his wife across the table and kissed the finger that wore her wedding band. He was in his early thirties with a scholarly face and clear blue eyes that seemed too friendly to go with the military buzz cut on his hair. He was in good shape with the swimmer's broad shoulders and wore tan slacks and a pale blue shirt. The shirt's top button was open and the knot in of his tie loose. A lightweight leather blazer was draped over the back of the chair he sat in. How goes the suit? Lauren gave a lopsided smile. Ludicrous as usual. The plaintiff doesn't have a hope in hell of winning his case. But you're going to represent him anyway. It wasn't a question. Jim and Lauren had been married long enough to know what the other thought and felt. Somebody has to, and it might as well be me, she grinned. It pays the bills, and it's not like I'm getting rapists and murderers put back on the street. Jim shivered at the thought. How those shysters can... He cut himself off. It was an old conversation and no longer either funny or even passionate. If he had been that upset by her legal career, he'd probably never have fallen in love with her or gotten married. Be grateful, she teased. This place is my treat for my ill-gotten gains. Then here's to nuisance suits. They both raised their glasses and clinked them before sipping. The Pacific dining car was a piece of old-style California dream as well as one of the finest restaurants in the state. It was dark in a warm and plush way, with leather and brass and all the glamour of the era in which it had been built. For some reason, it had become a favorite spot for off-duty and retired law enforcement officials. Cops, FBI, whatever. When they hit a certain age, they started making monthly trips to the car for that special night out. Jim Castle was neither retired nor technically off-duty but he couldn't think of a better place to meet his wife for lunch. Lauren was in the middle of a big copyright suit and loved to tell him about the celebrity gossip she was hearing firsthand. Now, she said, do you know what the studio seemed to think today? She stopped with a sigh as his cell phone started trilling. He gave her a sheepish look and answered the phone. Jim Castle here, what's... He fell silent, feeling every drop of blood drain away from him as Tony Chang quickly told him to get his ass down to Hill Street. The line was dead in ten seconds, but Jim sat a moment longer, staring in disbelief at his phone. Fuck. What, here? I'm game if you are. Uh, no. Sorry, it's... I gotta go. Her expression changed instantly, reacting to his stunned tone. What's happened? A bombing. He stood. You'll see it on the news any minute. He put on his jacket and bent to kiss her. Love you. As he passed the long bar, he could see the first aerial shots of Hill Street on CNN, with a thick column of smoke growing from the Metroline station entrance, like the beanstalk in the old kid's fairy tale. The world that Patty awoke to was utterly alien. It was warm and almost pitch black. Flickers and flashes of some kind of magical energy revealed her to be in a cave of some kind. The air was thick like soup and tasted so much of chalk and acid that she could barely breathe. When she opened her mouth to suck in a gulp of air, she could feel particles of atmosphere settling on her tongue. Her head literally buzzed, feeling as if every molecule, every brain cell was vibrating. It made her feel as if she was seeing red though so far she was mainly still seeing black. She couldn't hear much either. There were vague rumblings and feeble cries that could have been animals or, in such an alien environment, just about anything an SF writer could dream up. 
The only time Patty could remember hearing noises like that was on the swim team, gliding underwater and hearing the other girl's exertions through it. Everything sounded as if she were underwater now, which she couldn't be because she was breathing. She didn't know what exactly it was, but it felt like flour and tasted like barbecue smoke. She was lying at an angle on a jagged slope, which, as she pushed herself up onto shaky legs, she realized was a staircase. A man she didn't know was sitting against a buckled piece of metal, tilting his head very slowly and tenderly, as if he was afraid it might come off at any moment. Something touched her on the shoulder, and she spun around to face a figure with a gray face and hair matted with blood. She stepped back, making a fist to launch at the shambling creature's face. No zombie was going to eat her brain. A microsecond before her fist went through the figure's face, she recognized it. It wasn't some kind of flesh-eating zombie, but Will. Will was mouthing something, but all Patty could hear was that distant sound of sea life, drowned out by a rushing of water. That's when she realized the sea life sound effects were real sounds, and the rushing was blood in her own head, passing through the inside of her eardrums. She was deaf, or as near as, damn it, it all came back to her now. South Hill Street Metro Line Station, the bomb, the blast must deafen everyone in the station, and what she had thought was weird air was smoke and dust. Patty didn't know why this had happened, or whether there were other bombs, or what sort of damage casualties there had been. She did know that it surely couldn't be safe in here. If any of the dust and grit that she was breathing in had come from the ceiling, maybe there were cracks up there, and the whole lot might come down. Patty looked up the ceiling, intermittently lit by harsh blue flashes of arcing electrical current. For the first time she could remember, she found herself wondering just how heavy 30 feet of rock and earth were let alone the still and concrete buildings on the streets and all the cars and people. It was far too easy to imagine them all pouring in on top of her, smashing, crushing, and paling. She snapped her mouth shut, cutting off the slight whimpers she had begun to hear. This wasn't the time to be scared. Shocked, yes, but not scared. She looked around for the route to the surface. Get out first and be scared afterwards, she told herself. She kept repeating it silently like a mantra. Even as she pointed to her ear and said, hopefully aloud, that she couldn't hear anything. Will nodded his understanding and pointed to his own ear and shrugged. We have to get out, she shouted, waving him towards the exit. There was a faint grayish light seeping through the square archway that had admitted them to the station, and she hoped that was a sign that there was still a route to the street. Another figure staggered past on the way to the street exit. It was the yuppie type that Will had punched. The sight of him prompted Patty to look round for the other people who'd been around. The black guy was rising to his feet, still wearing his now shattered spectacles. He paused to help up the vaguely familiar looking girl. Now that she was bruised and covered in smoky dust, Patty found her even harder to place than before. One of the cops was hoisting the other one over his shoulder. The second cop had a bloody dent in his head and Patty had no idea whether he was alive or not. Either way, she decided it would be best not to distract the cop carrying him, in case he got hostile. The burly middle-aged guy in the checkered shirt was still on the floor, and Patty knelt beside him to check for a pulse. It was beating, but weak. Normally, she'd put him in the recovery position and not risk moving him, but she didn't want to leave the guy here in case there was another bomb, a ceiling collapse, or any of the dozen other things she could think of to go wrong. She called out to Will, who had turned to look at the survivors making for the exit. He didn't seem to hear her, so she picked up a handful of concrete chippings and threw them at him. He turned with a slightly henpecked expression. She beckoned him over, and when he saw what she was doing, he joined her at once. Take his legs, she shouted. Whether or not Will heard her, he understood her gesture and placed his hands under the backs of the guy's knees. Patty snaked her arms around under the man's armpits. Together, they heaved him off the floor. Patty briefly wondered whether it might have been wiser to let Will take the torso while she lifted the legs, but she wasn't going to waste time changing things around for physical ease now. Besides, she was in good shape. She worked out more than Will did, so it made more sense this way around. 
hoping that they wouldn't run into the others backed up behind a blocked exit. Patty guided Will up the stairs towards the surface, the muscles in her arms now burning almost as much as her lungs. Her heart began to sink when two figures emerged from the darkness. The way out must be blocked, she thought. They would have to go looking for another exit now. Flashlight beams snapped on, playing across Patty's eyes like a movie alien abduction special effect. The figures resolved themselves into firemen, wearing bulky protective clothing and full face masks. Patty grinned and was so relieved that she almost dropped the guy she and Will were carrying. If fire crews had been able to get in, then there was still a way out. The two firemen spoke to Patty in voices that she couldn't have made out even if they weren't muffled by their respirators. They took the unconscious man and led Patty and Will upwards out of the abyss and back into the light. It was raining outside. From a blank gray sky outside that looked as if that artist in charge of coloring in the world's background had quit work early again. Patty supposed that must be why there had been no shafts of beautiful California sun slanting down into the Metro Line station to show them the way to safety. Darkness had come in off the ocean during the day, like a shroud being drawn across the face of the city. Something about the shade of it depressed her, even more than the occasional winter rain usually did. Perhaps it was because it felt so uniform and impossible to focus on. It just felt infinite. Hill Street itself wasn't infinite, but it was cordoned off for a couple of blocks in either direction. Fire trucks and ambulances were parked nose to nose on either side of the street, with police cruisers jammed in where they could find a space. News choppers circled slowly overhead. Uniforms were everywhere. The dark blue of the LAPD, paramedic whites, fire crews protective gear all yellow and orange, with glowing stripes reflecting the lights from the choppers. Civilians were dirty and bedraggled, supported by each other or by rescue workers. Only one was in Patty's mind, and that was Will. She looked around for him and saw him leaning against the side of a fire truck throwing up. Someone set Patty down on the steel footplate at the back of an ambulance and cupped a plastic mask over her nose and mouth. Her hearing was beginning to reassert itself though her head still buzzed from the base of the skull up, as if the top of her neck was a cattle prod giving the brain some juice. So long as Will was okay, though, she didn't mind. That was love, she realized suddenly, the feeling of better me than him, rather than the other way round. Dark blues were just rolling out the police line tape when Jim Castle's silver Volkswagen Vanagon rolled onto Hill Street, but saw horses and diversion signs already sealed off both west first and hill half a block in all three directions from the metro station. At least the fire department had finished their work, so it was safe enough for the authorities to go down into the station. Jim waved his ID to be allowed through the cordon and park as close as he could to the station. It wasn't very close to the road. Immediately outside was choked with black and whites, fire trucks and ambulances. Thankfully, the cordon would keep the TV trucks out. But a news chopper was hovering overhead like a vulture. Jim gave it the finger, hoping he was in shot so the station would get fined for broadcasting the gesture. Even in the entranceway of the station, the air was thick with the smell of dust, soot, and the dead. Jim descended the steps into an extinguished hell inferno. The walls were pitted with little impact craters from shrapnel, while jagged pieces of broken tiles and plaster crunched underfoot. Streaks of soot blackened the upper walls and ceiling. The whole place was filled with the choking scent of burnt insulation and heated metal. Bright temporary arc lights had been set up on short poles in the tunnel, so that the cops, firemen, and other law enforcement people could see what or who they were stepping in as they sifted through the wreckage. Everybody was in a uniform of some description. The fire crews were in their safety gear and patrolmen in their dark blues, while everyone else had put on navy blue service wind cheaters with either police, FBI, or ATF in large golden letters on the back. Jim, someone called. It was Tony Cheng, a wiry Asian man of Jim's own age, with slightly sad eyes and a wispy goatee. Cheng was the senior agent in charge at the L.A. field office of the ATF. Cheng tossed Jim a spare ATF wind cheater. 
Jim pulled it on over his leather blazer. It made him uncomfortably warm, but he knew he wasn't going to be wearing it long enough to really suffer. Thanks, Jim said. What have we got? A bombing for sure. Whatever caused the blast was inside the carriage, so that rules out a gas leak in the tunnel or any kind of accident with a train motor. Shit. Jim felt his heart sink. Chang bared his teeth. No shit, it's shit. McAlman's going ape, and I can't say I blame him. Well, he's probably worried that he'll get shit-canned for not being clairvoyant enough to predict and prevent this one. Worrying about his pension makes him antsy. Worrying about his pension makes him an annoying prick, actually. Yeah, there is that, isn't there? Well, let's see what we can do about salvaging his pension and uh, our eardrums. You know what I'm saying? Come on, there's a couple of cops with an interesting story for us. Chang led Jim across the rubble-strewn platform and back up to the surface. Grateful to be out of the choking oven, Jim jogged back up to the street level, feeling healthier and happier with every step. Chang guided him through the emergency vehicles to a nearby ambulance. Two wounded uniform cops were there, one holding an ice pack to his head, the other lying on a gurney, with his shirt half off, having his elbow sprayed and strapped by a paramedic. Officer Russ, Chang said to the one standing, we'd like a word about what happened. I think it was a bomb, the cop said. So do we. What do you remember about what happened here? Uh... Uh, we were checking out a disturbance at the gate. Uh, a bunch of people were held up by this girl who wasn't letting them through. When we asked what was up, she said there was a bomb on the train. That set off more than enough alarm bells in Jim's head. He wanted to turn his back on these two men and run to an interview room to grill the girl, but he was professional enough to know he had to stay and get the rest of the cop's statements. Everything had to be done methodically, so as not to miss out any vital piece of information, however small, but it was excruciatingly frustrating to not be able to talk to a possible suspect straight away. The cop gave him a look that said they knew exactly what he was thinking and sympathized entirely. And then? Then the whole place went to hell, whammo! Uh, oh, at first I thought it was a quake, the big one, you know? Did you see anyone suspicious boarding the train or even waiting at the station earlier? You mean like a towel head and a robe and vest? He shook his head. No, nah, just the usual mix of people, but like I said, we were distracted by this altercation. Yeah. What happened to the people who were arguing, the girl especially? They were patched up. A couple that went to the ER, the rest are off to Parker Center to give statements. Under arrest? No way, man. Jim looked to Chang, who stood with his eyes closed in thought. After a moment, Chang glanced back at Jim. Okay, Jim, you go on down to Parker Center. The dark blue should have taken the survivor statements by now. Go through the statements, and if anything looks like it needs a follow-up, you can re-interview whoever. Right, sir, Jim said with a nod. He handed the ATF windbreaker back to Chang and made his way back to the van. It was only a few minutes' drive to Parker Center from here, and Jim used that time to think about the girl who had said there was a bomb on the train. Could she have been a conspirator with a conscience, or even a witness of some kind who had sought out a bomber's target to try to save lives? He supposed he'd find out soon enough. Okay, Slashaholics, this has been Chapter 3, Part 1 of Final Destination, Destination Zero. Dropping this as kind of a surprise upload, just to let you all know, this book is not a lost, uh, whatever, lost episode or lost media. I will be completing this book. Just a lot of stuff has happened since when I did Chapter 2. I had some health problems for a while. My father-in-law passed and my father passed, and it was just easier for me to get through shorter books 
and it didn't feel as overwhelming and, and uh, stressful. Um, but I'm, I'm finishing up a couple books right now, Halloween 5 and Child's Play. And uh, after that, I've got to, I've got to finish Freddy versus, versus Ash and um, Friday the 13th 7. Friday the 13th 7 is pretty short, like as far as books go here on the channel. Um, Destination Zero is like 400 pages. Friday the 13th 7, I think, is like 220 or something. Uh, once I get Friday the 13th 7 done, I'll return to this one, and we'll get this one wrapped up. And I still will be narrating Final Destination End of the Line and Final Destination 1 and 2 over time here on the channel. So I'm not done with Final Destination books, I promise. Uh, they just had to be put on the back burner for a little bit. But uh, I did have fun narrating the first half of Chapter 3 here. And I am interested in this story. And I hope you all enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments what you thought. And uh, I'll be back in the future with more of this book. Maybe even drop another surprise chapter every now and then until I can uh, focus on it uh, solely. Until then, this has been your friendly neighborhood 80 slasher librarian saying, Thanks for listening. Be excellent to each other. And always remember, the sun never sets on those who ride into it. Have a good night. Whether or not Will heard her, he undressed her gesture and... Not undressed. <laughs>